I've made a few videos on this channel about large bodies of water in North America that didn't exist. Well, in this video, I'll be covering ones that actually did. North America, like all continents, has undergone numerous geological changes over the course of its history, forming and then erasing hundreds of large bodies of water. I can't cover all of them, but I'll cover some of the most notable. We'll start with the Western Interior Seaway. This inland sea existed approximately 95 to 70 million years ago. At its peak, it was 2,500 feet deep, 600 miles wide, and it stretched over 2,000 miles from the present-day Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Ocean, dividing the continent of North America into two landmasses, Lemuridia in the west and Appalachia in the east. Evidence suggests that this sea was warm, and as you'd expect for such a large warm body of water, this seaway teemed with a diverse array of marine life, such as sharks, bony fish, birds, and reptiles. Tens of thousands of fossils have already been found from the sea, and the numbers continue to rise. The Western Interior Seaway disappeared due to a combination of the lowering of Earth's sea levels and regional uplift. Our next body of water is Lake Bonneville. Lake Bonneville covered most of modern-day Utah and small portions of Idaho and Nevada during the Pleistocene Epoch, between 30,000 to 10,000 years ago. At its peak, the lake covered an area of over 22,400 square miles, nearly as large as present-day Lake Michigan, and was nearly 1,000 feet deep. But as the ice age ended, the climate in the region became warmer and drier, resulting in less rainfall and runoff. Combined with increased evaporation, the lake began to retreat. Today, remnants of the lake can be seen in the form of the Bonneville Salt Flats, the Great Salt Lake, Utah Lake, and Severe Lake. There were actually quite a few large lakes in North America during this period. Dozens of bodies of water covered what we call today the Great Basin and the surrounding regions. I'll cover a few more of these in this video, but first, today's sponsor, International Intrigue, a witty, quick-to-read, free global news analysis. International Intrigue is great if you want an easy way to stay up to date with global news, to learn more about how foreign affairs actually works, or if you just want to get more entertaining version of world news. By signing up for their daily newsletter briefing, you'll receive the biggest geopolitical stories summarized in an easy-to-understand way that's fun to read. Just to be clear, International Intrigue is apolitical, and their newsletter and articles are written by three former diplomats, so you know you're getting quality information, and they can be read in less than five minutes. You'll get the main story, a roundup of what's going around the world, and a few other goodies as well. They also have a three times a week podcast for those who would rather listen than read, which includes long form interviews with experts. I personally subscribe to their newsletter and occasionally listen to their podcast. I don't have a whole lot of free time to read the news, so it's nice to have this simplified, easy to understand content. Then I'll dive in deeper later if there's a story that pertains to my work. It's just way more efficient. Again, that's international intrigue. I've left a link where you can check them out in the description below. Now on to our next body of water, Lake Missoula. Like Lake Bonneville, Lake Missoula existed during the last ice age. It was located in what is today western Montana. The lake was formed as a result of the damming of the Clark Fork River by the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. It covered an area of about 3,000 square miles, or 7,700 square kilometers, and contained about 500 cubic miles, or 2,100 cubic kilometers of water. But every now and then, the ice dam would break, unleashing catastrophic floods that shaped much of the Pacific Northwest, including the carving out of the scablands of eastern Washington. This event, known as the Missoula Floods, is thought to have occurred approximately 40 times during its existence from around 15,000 to 13,000 years ago. For our next body of water, we'll head to Mexico. This is Lake Texcoco. With a surface area of around 2,100 square miles, or 5,400 square kilometers, it may have slipped by as one of the 25 largest lakes in the world if it existed today. The Aztec Empire's capital of Tenochtitlan was located on an island within this lake. According to legend, the Aztecs once had their home further north, but became nomadic and slowly moved south for 200 years, taking directions from their priests who were said to be taking directions from their deities. The Aztec god of war, the sun, and human sacrifice 
told the Aztec people they must build their new home where they find an eagle sitting on a cactus eating a snake. The eagle was finally spotted in 1325 on an island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. This is why you see an eagle on a cactus eating a snake on the Mexico flag. But the Aztecs made a few modifications to the lake to make it habitable. They built causeways that reached surrounding islands and to the lake's shores. They created artificial islands and brought potable water into Tenochtitlan from the mountains with a 3 kilometer aqueduct. To ensure the crops around the city received fresh water, a dike was built to separate the fresh from the brackish water. Over 200,000 people lived in Tenochtitlan at its peak in 1519, which made it one of the largest cities in the world, and larger than any city in Europe at the time. Tenochtitlan of course no longer exists. It was destroyed by the Spanish Empire, and Lake Texcoco was drained to prevent flooding of what is now Mexico City. Our next body of water is Lake Corcoran, which covered the Central Valley of California. It existed between about 758,000 and 665,000 years ago. Weirdly, this lake drained from too much precipitation and glacial melt. The lake overflowed and carved a new outlet in the present-day San Francisco Bay, draining the lake. One of its remnants is Tulare Lake. Now maybe I shouldn't have included this lake because it recently made a comeback after heavy precipitation in California in the first few months of 2023 reaching a surface area of around 100 square miles. At Tulare Lake's peak, it was 690 square miles. Based upon surface area, it was the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi River, and the second largest freshwater lake entirely in the United States. Americans began moving into the region in 1826. They then built a series of dams to prevent floods and canals to divert water for agriculture. The lake dried up by the mid 20th century, but the area does occasionally flood, as it has this year, resulting in Tulare Lake being called the Phantom Lake and the lake that won't die. Our next body of water, Lake Lahontan. This lake also existed during the Plasticine Epoch and was located mostly within what is today the state of Nevada. It had a surface area of over 8,500 square miles or 22,000 square kilometers. It had pretty much dried up by around 9,000 years ago Pyramid Lake and Walker Lake are both remnants of Lake Lahontan. And our last body of water of the video, Lake Agassiz. This lake also existed at the end of the last glacial period due to the melting of ice sheets that covered much of Canada and parts of northern United States. At its peak around 11,000 years ago, it had a larger surface area than all of the modern Great Lakes combined, covering an area as large as 170,000 square miles or 440,000 square kilometers, making it larger than any currently existing lake in the world. And it's even nearly 30,000 square kilometers larger than the Caspian Sea. The lake drained and refilled a few times with the slight fluctuations in climate. These drainage events were so large that they had significant impacts on global climate, sea level, and possibly even early human civilization. Some suggest that one of its floods may have also accounted for the various flood myths of prehistoric cultures. The lake's massive freshwater release into the Arctic Ocean around 11,000 years ago has been hypothesized to have disrupted oceanic circulation, causing a temporary cooling period known as the Younger Dryas. Around 8,500 years ago, with the Earth's climate warming once again and the glaciers quickly retreating, Glacial Lake Agassiz filled and then drained one last time. This final drainage of Lake Agassiz resulted in sea levels rising between 0.8 to 2.8 meters or 2.6 to 9.2 feet. And that's all for this video. This certainly wasn't all of the large bodies of water that used to exist in North America, but I hope you found the video interesting. Thank you to all my Patreon and YouTube members for supporting the channel, and thank you all for watching.